with that, I'm going to turn it over to the next panel, and the only good news is that I'm also on it, so I can introduce my co-presenters with me very quickly here. Uh, Brianna and Rebecca both have spoken already, and so we're going to get going on this right away to keep ourselves on time here. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. We're going to let you talk, and we're going to give you a little poll here. The poll is, where are you working? This is, uh, with the title of the session, of course, being At Work with COVID, we want to get a little sense of what people are currently doing. So if you'll take a moment and just answer where you're working at. Um, obviously, I think all three of us are already starting to see more transitions of people going back to the office if they had been away from the office. But I think, um, you know, people who could work remotely, the employers are sort of working through what does it mean that we've had people working remotely now. So what is the results here? Ah, most people are back in the office or never left the office. That's about 63%. Still at home, 16%. So that's the smallest amount, but still hybrid too. So that's an interesting result here. And thank you for answering those. Um, with that, why don't we go ahead and give our quick overview. This session, what Rebecca, Brianna, and I did is we put together these things as questions and answers to try and make this a little more fun and do this a little differently. And we're going to be rotating through who's answering these things. Our first question, and that we get, and all these are based on questions we've been getting, uh, is going to go to Rebecca here. And Rebecca, why don't I let you take it away? Okay, thanks, Tim. So um, this does not surprise us because the difference about sort of where people are working and whether they ever stopped working in the work site has really varied across the country, um, and so does the answer to this. Uh, and but the truth is that mostly, mostly, and we have some exceptions, federal law permits, and so does state law in Minnesota, permits, and North Carolina, it permits an employer to re ask employees to re wear masks. Now, rewind to like last year at this time, there was laws that required employers to wear masks, and those varied throughout the country. But right now, what we have is a sort of permissive state. There is no state law nor any federal law that says you can't make an employee wear a mask. However, there are lots of other um, uh, factors that go into this. Um, and it's important to remember that, that OSHA has a general duty clause, and I think I get to expand on that a little later, but you always wanna make sure that you're complying with the most protective of the employee law when these things are issued. So last, Thursday, I think it was, the CDC said, woohoo, vaccinated people can take their masks off. And this was just the like storm of like people like Brianna and me and Tim and everybody else on the panel, like answering questions every hour. OSHA has said, please feel free to follow the CDC's guidance, although there is some conversation about whether OSHA is going to issue permanent and different guidance. But for now, OSHA's website's been updated and says, go ahead and follow CDC guidance. But it's important to know, and this is where we get circular and crazy and why people hate lawyers, CDC's guidance says, follow, you know, safety rules and follow employer rules. So the big announcement that happened last week with CDC was not an employer announcement. It was an individual announcement. CDC was talking to citizens of the United States, right? <laughs> they were saying, okay, if you're vaccinated, you may take your mask off and you probably never needed to wear your mask in public anyway. And we're for sure lifting that. But now we're saying you can take your mask off indoors. But it was acknowledging that first premise I made, which was private employers generally have the right to implement reasonable rules that are designed to th do things like keep people safe. And as Jack noted in that his earlier presentation with the OSHA penalty, you don't want to do rules that prevent people from being safe. And the current CDC guidance is vaccinated people can go mask free, which of course means unvaccinated people should still be wearing their masks. So I get that that's a horrible employee relations issue. Um, but the point is, that's what the CDC guidance is. The CDC is the Center for Disease Control. So they're just telling us what the science is. It's my experience, and I would love to hear whether Brianna can confirm this. My experience is the people who are vaccinated are still fine wearing their masks, even though the science says they don't have to. And the people who are resisting uh, vaccination for non-medical and non-religious reasons, not for medical or religious reasons, but for non-medical, didn't wanna wear their mask in the first place. So that's a real challenge to you as an employer. Cause if you're gonna have a rule, I don't care if the rule is you have to show up on time, if you have to submit your expense reports on time, or if you have to wear a mask in common areas of your work site, 
you have to think about whether you can consistently enforce that. And that's really the employer's consideration. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, let uh, us go to the next slide. And Brianna, I think you get to take the next slide here. I do, and it's another exciting hot topic. Um, and you know, Re Rebecca and Tim and I and the rest of the panelists have been preparing for this presentation for the last week or so. And as Rebecca just mentioned, things are changing rapidly. Um, this question of whether employers can require vaccines is, there have been developments almost every hour for the last couple of weeks, and that's <laughs> gonna continue. So I guess I wanna sort of preface the discussion here today on that fact, which is this, what we tell you today could be different tomorrow. And that is, that is not an exaggeration. Um, so you have to keep, keep up with what's happening, certainly locally. Um, and, and if you have employees in other states, keep track of what's happening in, in the states where you have employees. But um, for purposes of today <laughs> and right now, the question here is, can employers require vaccines? And of course, the answer is, um, you know, the lawyer, the lawyer's favorite answer, which is it depends. Um, <clears throat> unless prohibited based by state law, the answer is yes, employers can mandate vaccines for their employees. And that comes from the EEOC um, and, and, and federal guidance. There's no rule that employees, that employers cannot require that for their employees. However, there are states every day enacting new legislation um, discussing new legislation that puts restrictions on that in various ways. And we have a couple of slides that are going to touch on this. So I'm not going to go through everything that's related to the vaccine topic on this slide. But um, for purposes, purposes of this slide, I'll remind you what Jack talked about in the first presentation, which is that uh, North Dakota had proposed legislation on this issue, which did not pass the session. Um, so right now, employers in North Dakota can require vaccines for their employees. Um, but just over the border in Montana, the same is not true. So Montana just recently, I think on May 7th, um, enacted a anti-discrimination, an extension basically of their anti-discrimination statute that applies to vaccine status or um, uh, possession of an immunity passport. Um, and so employers in Montana cannot discriminate in the terms and conditions of employment, including hiring, firing, et cetera, based on the vaccination status of their employees. Um, there are lots of other states that are considering various statutes, and Rebecca and I are going to talk more about that at the end of this half hour. Um, so I want to just kind of focus on like what Rebecca did, sort of the practical considerations. As an employer, this is going to be a difficult issue for you for the next probably year, maybe longer. Um, and so think about things like CDC guidance, which Rebecca just described, you know, um, one of the carrots that you can use is, is education, you know, talking to your employees, giving them information, providing them with resources as sort of encouraging them to learn more, make their own decision. Um, we've also mentioned in some of the other presentations, incentives like time off. Um, we talked about during the ARPA presentation that the um, one of the covered reasons for that time off and the tax reimbursements is vaccine, getting a vaccine or sick time related to that. Um, so there's something to consider. Um, of course, there are, you know, the sticks along with the carrots for employers who do want to mandate vaccines. You have to consider what is that going to mean for employees who refuse to get a vaccine and don't have a, a accommodation reason for not getting it. Is that going to mean they're not allowed to come back into the office? Is that going to mean um, you're going to have additional safety requirements for those individuals? Or is that going to mean a change in their duties or that they're not allowed to work there anymore? So those are tough questions. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is just kind of complications, and, and this is similar to what Rebecca stated with the masks, but things like employee morale. I mean, how what is that going to do to the to the morale of your employees in the workplace? Um, also, complications with tracking who is vaccinated, kind of keeping track of that and dealing with noncompliance is a is a mess and um, can be tricky. So that's sort of one of those like, is it easier just to not do it? Um, 
yes. <laughs> uh, but you, you have to make those decisions depending on, on what kind of business you're in and how many employees you have and the resources you have and all of those types of fact specific inquiries. Um, and then the religious and medical exemptions. And we're going to get into reasonable, reasonable accommodations more generally and, and sort of the EEOC response to this. But um, you would, if you, if employers want to mandate vac vaccines, they have to keep in mind um, that they have to provide exemptions for religious and uh, medical reasons. And, and we'll get more details on that. So the next slide is another exciting poll, I think. Oh, maybe not. Not quite yet. But that's oh, okay. not quite yet. Sorry, you'll have to wait. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, building off of what uh, both Rebecca and Bria have been saying, I was going to talk a little bit more about incentives. And just to follow up on that, it actually, we even got a question that asking, are many employers per offer incentives? And so far, my answer is, at least my experience is not yet, but the number is growing. And I think that number will continue to grow um, as, as, our, as vaccination plateaus and we're getting to say 60 or 70 percent, but we're not getting to 80 or 90 percent, I think more employers will probably consider offering incentives. So a real quick, some practical questions and suggestions about incentives if you decide to go down that route. Um, again, in some industries, they're probably more likely employers will want to do this as well. Um, so should you provide a notice to employees about the incentive? And the short answer is yes, the EEOC and its guidance basically suggests that you want to try and indicate to people they shouldn't accidentally give you more medical information than necessary. It's fine. Like, let's say they bring in the vaccination card and that's all you get. That's great. But even that has sort of a patient ID number on it. And you probably want to get into that. And if, let's say, they bring you something else like an explanation of benefits or something else to try and document things, who knows if they received other services. So that's that. What documentation to request? Potentially the card. As I say here, you could maybe just take a note of what was the last day of the shot, the last shot received and not keep the card or something and just note that so you have that. Um, what about employees who object due to medical or religious reasons? Well, uh, all of my labor employment colleagues are going to be the first people to answer this, but basically the short answer is you can request that they certify that that's why they're objecting. You could ask that a medical physician or a religious or spiritual advisor confirm that. Uh, but then you'd still need to pay the incentive to those employees to avoid discrimination, I believe. And again, uh, all my labor employee law colleagues could get into that in more detail. Finally, how to report on payroll. It's going to be taxable income generally. You'd want to review your 401k plan to see if it's going to be compensation subject to the 401k plan or not. But those are some considerations if you do an incentive. And as they say, right now, only a few employers are doing it. But at least um, it's one of those things. And I think that in essence, it's going to be something that's going to become more and more common here as we move forward. Now, on to poll number two here. Uh, the big question is, will your employer require employees to be vaccinated before being allowed to return to work? If you could let us know what your thoughts are, if people are looking at this. Uh, the poll is open now, and we can take a look at that. Um, Again, this is something I think it's sort of a developing area and it might all vary greatly by the type of employer you are, right? I think that the more you are, say, customer facing, if you're an interactive place like a movie theater or something like that, you might be more inclined to try and get all your employees vaccinated so you can tell your patrons people are vaccinated or a restaurant. On the other hand, it could vary. And here is the answer and the answer is overwhelmingly no. Uh, which I can understand that, you know, it's a hard issue, but that's where incentives then might come in where if you aren't mandating it, that incentives might be more used to try and encourage people. Um, with that, I think we'll go on then to the next slide here. And can employers limit what states employees perform remote work in? Another issue that's come up or been highlighted by the pandemic. And let's see here. I think that this is uh, Rebecca and Tim to so take us through this. So talking about myself as a third person, but the answer, Rebecca, it depends. It depends, right? Tim. It really does depend. <laughs> um, uh, of course, um, maybe, uh, I don't know if you want to start with the tax stuff and then I'll do the wage stuff. Uh, sure. Real quickly, one of the things you have to understand if you're doing this is what are the state income tax and other issues there? Um, and oftentimes, if an employee is working in another state for any period of time, they might owe a state income tax. And part of it then gets to, is there some sort of employer nexus where then the employer might have to be reporting or withholding wages? Sometimes the state might have a de minimis exclusion of some type. But um, if you are going to have people working in other states, you really want to understand that. And then Rebecca, the employment issues. So um, 
generally speaking, the employment laws of where the person is performing their services is what controls uh, in terms of the most friendly. So of course, federal, if it's the most friendly to an employee would control regardless of where they, but if you were performing your services in a state or location that had more friendly laws, then of course that would be uh, applicable. And the biggest place we see that is wage and hour. Um, some states have higher minimum wages. Uh, and if you are a government contractor and you have to comply with the Davis-Bacon Act or the McNamara Service Contract Act, or if you've got H-1B workers and have a prevailing wage obligation, then the location of where they are providing the services is where you have to have comply with the prevailing wage. Uh, and then finally, you need to report on, even if you're in a lucky state in which, um, uh, if you're in a state that doesn't have an income tax, you still probably have to pay unemployment income tax. <laughs> um, and that is still something that both the person and the company contribute to. And that's also in the place where the person performs their services. And then there's the workers comp. Um, uh, in certain states, you have to contribute to the state. They have a closed system as opposed to states that have a private, you can get your own coverage. So those are all things that come into play, which is why it depends because if those things are prohibitive, you're not required to take that on. And, and it, you know, now that there are no, that we are aware of no mandates that people work from home. That was true during some of the height of the pandemic, that if you could work from home, you did have to work from home. Those have pretty much um, all sunsetted. Um, we think employers can require people to not work in a certain state. Okay. And we've got some additional considerations, but as we're going through things here, I'm going to actually go to our next one and turn over to Brianna to answer the next big question. Yes, I was just making sure I'm not on mute. Okay, so so it's a it's a related question. Can employers require employees to work at work rather than at home? Um, and this is a it's an it depends, but it's mostly a yes. Um, it's an it depends that leans toward the yes, and that is largely in part again due to the rapid changes that we've seen in the recent weeks. Um, unless prohibited by state law, employers may require their employees to work in the office rather than at home. And up until uh, last week or the week before, um, it was, Minnesota was one of those states where, where employers were required to have employees working from home if they could. Um, just recently in the last week or so, that changed. It's no longer required in Minnesota. It is now strongly encouraged that if employees can work at home, they do so, uh, but it's not a requirement. So even in Minnesota, if employers uh, now want to require their employees to come back into the office, they can. This is another one, though, where the additional considerations are um, really should be sort of the guiding principles when you're thinking about this, because you have things like reasonable accommodations, which we have another slide for. So I'll save that as a teaser. Um, but you also want to think about the OSHA considerations on site health and safety requirements. What kind of screenings are you requiring? Um, lots of states most states still have requirements about um, safety screenings, health and safety screenings for employees, um, making sure that they don't have symptoms, checking for fever, things like that. Um, and so you, you want to comply with those. In North Dakota, um, it's a recommendation. It's not a requirement, but there are recommendations for places like restaurants and event venues, personal care services that they screen their employees for symptoms, including a temperature check. Um, so you, if you are going to be requiring employees to come back into work, you want to make sure that you are doing what you need to do to keep your employees safe. Um, and then there's some sort of, you know, soft, uh, soft requirements like if employees really want to keep working at home, um, you know, what has it been like for the last year? Have they been productive? Um, you know, did you notice an impact? on your on your bottom line um, and that could include costs of uh of workspace so there's lots of things that can go into into that consideration and, and many employers are considering that here in minneapolis we've had big companies decide to close down their offices including target closing its um, downtown minneapolis office which i'm going to get the number wrong but rebecca and tim i don't know if you remember how many employees that affected it was thousands um, that are no longer going to be um, required to work in the office in downtown Minneapolis, though I believe they'll have the option to do so. So that's just one example. Um, and I think a lot of that was cost reasons for Target, but also employee um, engagement. I think Target did did analysis and realized that they their employees were just as effective and productive um, from home. So things to consider in terms of answering this question for your own business. 
You know, I think we're going to skip the next poll just to go ahead and keep ourselves on track here. Instead, let's jump right back with you, Brianna, and talk about does the ADA reasonable accommodation analysis here with respect to remote work? Well, you didn't leave very, very much time for people to suffer with my teaser, Tim. They didn't even have to wait <laughs> past the poll. So, um, so this was the this was the reasonable accommodation teaser that I just mentioned. Um, and and the question here is, does the increase in remote work affect the ADA reasonable accommodation analysis? And the answer here is probably. Um, there are lots of new questions to consider that that didn't exist in the same way in, um, you know, let's say February 2020 as they do now, because it, it was more of an exception than a rule to have employees working from home. It was maybe seen as a perk or a benefit or something special or something unique. And now everyone, um, lots of people have been doing it for the last year and in, in many cases successfully. So um, there are still, you know, questions to ask about um, for individual employees when, when the question is, can working from home be a reasonable accommodation? Um, the main one is, you know, related to the duties that the employee is performing. Have the duties been performed successfully at home in the past? And this is what I mean when I say this is a question that's answered differently now than it was February 2020 and, and earlier. Um, I think it, you know, there's a lot of employers that would be hard pressed now to say that employees can't successfully perform their duties at home. Um, but a fair question to ask as well, and an important one is, are others who perform the same duties working from home? So if employers are bringing everybody back and expecting that everybody sort of return to pre-February 2020 work status, um, you know, are you going to make exceptions for individuals in the same um, sort of position that are performing the same type of duties and you want to make consistent application and consistent decisions with regard to that question? Um, do state COVID-19 orders require additional accommodation measures? So this is what I just mentioned with regard to Minnesota. Um, this is not actually yesterday anymore. This is probably yesterday from the day that we made the slide. So apologies for the date on that, but um, employers are strongly encouraged to allow employees to work from home if they can continue to do so. But this doesn't say anything about reasonable accommodations. So um, you have to sort of look at your specific um, work situation, the employee, the duties, and that gets to the policy considerations, which is, you know, do policies require a specific performance level in order to allow from work from home? And this really requires, as with any reasonable accommodation analysis, a review of the essential functions of the job. And, and so really what's different now is just that we have a situation where lots of employees, I think something like 60 or 70% nationwide on average have been relatively successfully working from home for a year. And so it, when you look at the essential functions analysis, how, how is that different? Great. All right. Well, let's go on here and talk about what does this mean with respect to OSHA, Rebecca? Sure. And um, uh, I do think that uh, the next panel is going to go into the ADA a little more in depth, too. So in case you had questions on that one, I want to um, note that um, it that the who can who can mandate vaccinations and who can't is one of those things that's changing every hour as well. Um, and I can't remember what we said earlier in this one, um, Montana clearly had that and they passed it in a way that was like a protected trade and we didn't alert on that. But um, Florida and of course, notably North Dakota and Texas also have laws that have now been enacted that um, prevent um, some sort of discrimination on the basis of vaccination status and or um, prohibits a mandate to get vaccinated. And that's relevant to this because of course OSHA, which is uh, telling employers that they can follow the CDC guidance, um, uh, but is also still got that general duty clause. Um, and so if you don't require the vaccine, which you might not be able to in certain states, right, and you um, have to provide a safe workplace, then all of the restrictions that were in place when no one was vaccinated need to be thought through. Because if you are not sure of people's vaccination status, you don't want to know, you don't want to inquire, and you know you're not mandating it, then you kind of have to assume that anybody that you're working with is possibly at risk, and you don't want them to claim that they got the COVID-19 um, infection 
through your lax practices. Now, um, we've seen a lot of cases um, uh, not go anywhere in the workers' comp section, like, right, if you think you got injured or ill at work, you're going to have to file a workers' comp claim for that. And so that's sort of your exclusive remedy if you think your employer wasn't doing something safe. But that doesn't mean that OSHA won't get involved. And as Jack already noted, OSHA is getting involved. So if you, so, you know, if you're preventing people from doing something that they believe is safe, you're going to be in trouble with OSHA, even if OSHA hasn't yet required you to do stuff that was really far more in place a year ago at this time than it is now. And I just want to make a note too, that like there are safe um, operations requirements at the executive level of each state. So some governors have issued what you need to do to maintain safe operations. And so those would have the same force of law as a statute. And then certain states, notably Minnesota, has its own state OSHA and California has its own state OSHA. And so they are allowed to pass more protective laws than the federal law. So in North Dakota, you can follow federal guidance under OSHA, but if you've got folks in other states where there is a state um, OSHA, you need to worry about what that state's doing. And then you also need to double check the executive orders that are coming out of the governor's office because those are the force of law. Everything else is guidance, but guidance is used as a defense or um, uh, if, you're, if you're following guidance, then it's gonna be hard for OSHA to cite you for doing something unsafe. So it's really important to know what that guidance is because that serves as a good defense. Um, and um, I think I might've taken up more time on that one so we can move on. <laughs> no problem. Brianna, what about the EEOC? What are they doing with COVID? Um, yeah, I just want to cover this uh really quickly because i know we have some more slides to cover and i want to get make sure tim has enough time um we've touched on a couple of these topics already so i'll just mention briefly um the the guidance on employer inquiries toward the bottom of the slide um the eeoc has has provided some clarity and we have um this link i don't think it's a live link but you can use that search once you have the materials to get the full um, guidance document from the EEOC uh, regarding employer inquiries. So you can ask if um, employers are permitted to ask certain questions about employees entering the workplace to reduce the risk of workplace exposure. And those questions include whether the employee has been diagnosed with COVID-19, um, asking for the reason for their absence from work, asking about if they have symptoms, um, COVID-19 symptoms such as fever, cough, et cetera, which are, which are guided by the CDC. Um, and then also whether the, where the employee has traveled, even if the travel is for personal reasons. So those questions are permitted um, to ask employees who are returning to the office. I wanted to just also add that, that they updated it in March 2020, but they have continually been updating it since then. And so most recently, um, and this is subject to all of the state laws that we've been talking about, you can ask if someone's vaccinated under OSHA's, I mean, I'm sorry, under EEOC's ADA, the mere question of it, it's what you do with that question and what, how you follow it up. So if Tim says, Rebecca, are you vaccinated? And I say no. And he says, why? Now we're stepping afoul of the EEOC's guidance. But if he just says, Rebecca, are you vaccinated? And I say no. And then he moves on. He hasn't violated the EEOC's guidance. And, and I have Rebecca as my counsel, so I don't ask Rebecca those questions. But going on <laughs> to the next slide here. So. Um, real quickly through these two slides, are employers adopting the voluntary paid sick leave under the ARPA or the voluntary family leave? I'm just going to cover them both. I, I, the first was really it depends. Some employers are adopting this, but you keep in mind, as discussed earlier, if you do, you have to provide the full two weeks. You have to provide for all the reasons that are provided for. And so, you know, in, in some cases, especially if a state maybe is mandating leave that the employer provides or has a provision about using leave for uh, COVID reasons, the employer might consider this. Um, really on the second one though, are people or employers adopting the paid family leave? I've not seen any really. I'm not really hearing a lot about entities that are doing that because that's voluntary. Why don't we quick do our poll number four here has your employer adopted paid vol voluntary paid leave under the ARPA? And that'll give us a little more of a sense on that. While we're talking about that or just getting a chance for people to take that poll here, I will note that if, if you are an employer and you're adopting that, there is some guidance from the IRS about, again, how you get those payroll credits, because as with the FFCRA, all this is then being reimbursed to employers through payroll credits in one way, shape, or form. 
The IRS does have some guidance up on its website that you can work through with your payroll department if you are utilizing one of those. So that's just a brief note on that. And so here, our, uh, our survey indicates that basically about 21%, about one in five are adopting some form of voluntary leave under the ARPA, which is interesting. Not unsurprising, I'm guessing almost all that's going to be with respect to the sick leave aspect. So let's go real quickly into what states are doing here. I'm sorry, we're going to run one or two minutes over on this uh, panel, I think, and we might shorten our break, but we'll go from there. So real quickly, two states that have adopted specific COVID paid leave law requirements, California and Colorado. In general, an employer needs to provide up to 80 hours of paid sick leave for those FFCRA reasons. And in general, if both states require that employers post and provide notice to employees about the availability of this leave, we could spend 15 minutes on this subject in and of itself, so I'm not going to do that right now. But please know if you have employees in those states or in California cities, you probably want to talk to someone and to make sure you're documenting what you're doing to comply with these state laws. I should note some other states as well uh, allow their paid leave laws. So I believe New York allows its paid leave rules to be used for COVID. It's just that these states have adopted specific COVID paid leave requirements. So it's not just limited to this. There's other issues to address in other states, but these are two to note for sure. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to both Rebecca and Brianna to sort of talk about states in general and how employment practices are being responded to with respect to COVID. So um, it really depends on where you are, and it's going to be a lesson for somebody who's getting their political science degree in about 20 years because they're going to have a wonderful thesis to write about politics of diseases. Um, uh, on the East Coast, as you can imagine, as Tim said, New York's got... Um, uh, increased sick leave, but they already had mandated sick leave. Um, there's some other states in the East, as you can imagine, Massachusetts and Maryland um, and New Jersey also have mandated sick leave. Um, uh, and so I think if you've got employees in the East, you need to talk to council who's aware of what local requirements are. If you've got employees who are working remotely and move back East, you need to do that. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to go to the Midwest, Brianna. Um, yeah, so this, I feel like we've kind of touched on this throughout the course of the presentation, but right now there's pending legislation in lots of states. I think there's at least 18 states where um, one branch of government or the other has proposed one form of rule or the other with regard to vaccines. And those range from um, sort of like a low level kind of informed consent requirement all the way to anti-discrimination statutes like we spoke about in, in Montana. Um, right now there are pending, there is pending legislation related to vaccines in, I'll just kind of cover Midwest and Mountain West together, Colorado, Idaho, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, just to name a few that I found this morning just to kind of do a quick survey. Um, so it's something to keep an eye on and, um, we will uh, continue to keep you apprised of updates on that. Yeah, uh, I think people already know that they can't go into the West without talking to a lawyer, but um, the West has always been sort of the leader in paid time off and they just enhance that with regard to this current pandemic. I hate being the person that deprives people of breaks. So I think that we can save any specific questions um, for the, um, ask the attorneys section, but I do um, think that people need to be aware in both places. I have caught clients in California and I have clients in New York who are shocked that if they have people in their plant in Iowa, they don't wanna wear masks. The flip side is I have people in North Dakota who are shocked that people who are vaccinated are still wearing their masks. So um, it, it, we, are, we are a country of 50 states and there is definitely different attitudes in every state. Mm -hmm. Perfect. We're at 1125 now. We're going to shorten the break up here a little bit and go ahead and come back at 1130, 1131 at the latest and get going on our next session about leaves. Thank you all so much for your attention and for the questions and things. We're going to have to get to those during the Ask the Attorneys. Thanks, and we'll go to a five-minute break. <laughs> 